Thank you very much um, for that incredibly generous introduction, Professor Ramogondo and Professor <laughs> Pageng. <laughs> you know what I almost said. Um, <laughs> good evening. I um, listening to, I'm not sure that you're going to get the answer about what to do with post-colonial scholars in the era of decolonization. Um, because I'm not sure which is the era of decolonization. There have been so many. I guess the simple answer is what, do what you will with post-colonial scholars. <laughs> Good evening. I'm honored to be invited to give this year's TB Davy lecture. Thank you to the Academic Freedom Committee, its chair, Professor Eleluanu Ramugondo, the VC, Professor Mamukhe Tipageng, and all the people who worked really hard to make sure that I could get here with the behind the scenes work. As a professor and as a UCT graduate three times over, I am especially appreciative of the legacy of this lecture which stands as testimony to the kinds of principles and values we want to uphold in the academy, to independence from political and market interference, to the commitment to the value of intellectual and scholarly work at a time when we very often are invited or bullied into being apologetic for valuing and choosing intellectual and scholarly work, pride of place for rigor, contestation as crucial. When T.B. Davy, when Professor T.B. Davy insisted on a university's independence to make decisions about what to teach, who to teach, and how to teach based on the rigor and merit of those categories, he was saying something about what a university ought to be. This is a vision of something, an ideal to defend and to do so in the midst of onslaught. In 2018, we pretend that all UCT communities agreed with him. We do not say so. When we speak of Professor T.B. Davy, we simply omit the contestation within UCT about the values that its leader stood for so unapologetically. The fact of history is an inconvenient truth. T.B. Davy's stance was under very difficult times. It was inconvenient, but he held fast, even as all around him, there were others at universities elsewhere who argued differently, who were not as affronted by Apartheid's attempts to stifle freedom of intellectual work. Those within the intelligentsia, the professorate, who upheld the Nationalist Party notions of a useful university, useful to the apartheid machinery, state and status quo. Useful, in other words, to suppression, to white supremacy, to intersecting forms of occlusion, exclusion and oppression. The roots of this lecture link clearly the connection between what a university is for and what we would like it to be and justice. These freedoms are not separate. His was not only an ideal, as important as ideals are. It was also a response and rejection of prevailing notions of value, of truth, of power. When we think about academic freedom as a dynamic positive force, as we must, we do so looking to a past whose inheritance is clarity about the kinds of spaces that are worthy of defending when we speak about universities. The past is one, sorry, this past, this room is freezing, is that deliberate? <laughs> I don't remember UCT venues being this cold, <laughs> but then it's been a long time since I left, so I may be misremembering. This past is one that highlights the importance of what we need to retain, protect, 
defend the academy from as much as it is more to a vision of what a university can be and what it should be for. The freedom of the academy is both for its own sake. And indivisible from other liberties. Now, whereas for many of us in the academy, what a university is for remains quite clear. The value and values of a university are under constant contestation. None of us would have missed the relentless invitation to turn universities into glorified training schools, vocational schools. We have all had to respond to and navigate expectations that we are here to train students who will respond to what the market requires, demands, or that we are to reshape ourselves in direct response to the will of funders and, and investors. This insistence on being useful for markets is not unique. Although some of the faces of such expectations mutate somewhat in our day, at the same time, we also occupy universities that contain within them the disciplines and schools that really do not make much sense given what a university is for. And I'm not always certain that the decisions here or in other academies across the world to incorporate some teaching that merely trains students to fill existing gaps in the employment market is not in conflict with these loved ideas of what universities are for. To think about academic freedom from the South African Academy and to think about academic freedom globally is to also be mindful of a confluence of governmental threats to academic freedom, to the academy, the tree of the trivialization of freedom to question, to investigate, to contest, threats that Bibi Bagara Yusuf insists numb the imagination. Academic freedom is always haunted by this invitation to generate complexity in the midst of pressure to conform. I was struck recently by the rage expressed by members of a South African university, academic, administrative and student, an analysis offered by their vice chancellor in a media report. He was quoted as speaking frankly and forthrightly about some of the surmountable challenges at the university he heads. These were met with ire, not because they were intellectually misdirected or invalid or baseless or even just plain wrong all categories which seemed besides the point, to my shock. But because he had spoken out of turn, the charge was that as the university's chief accounting officer, he ought to have spoken, he ought not to have spoken as he did. Upon countering this with references to academic freedom, I was very quickly reminded that this was secondary. Academic freedom was secondary to the university's business interests and public face. Wish as we might, the defense of academic freedom is not something that enjoys universal support as a principle across the academy. It is possible for many to be concerned with academic freedom only in so far as they are personally and individually protected from incursions against their work. There is much literature on incursions from government and to a lesser extent markets on academic freedom. Such work helps us with the difficult thinking of how we respond to different manifestations of power within and beyond the university. In our tussles here, we are clear on the entanglement of academic freedom with issues of power, how we respond to power. We are aware, like T.B. Davy and his peers, of the importance of responding to power in very clear ways, strategies which always carry some degree of risk. Unlike many people outside the academy who often use academic synonymously 
with that which does not matter in any substantial way, as in the oft-heard phrase, oh, that is academic. <laughs> we understand how indispensable the epistemic project is. As vigilant as we sometimes can be against external threats and challenges to academic freedom, the gaze is often averted from a critical interrogation of performances of power within the academy. But academic freedom has to be about how we respond to power variously located. Attentive to the consequences of contestations even by those we do not understand or necessarily sympathize with and reflective of how we translate our ideas into arguments. Most importantly, academic freedom, when claimed as a right, insists on contestation free from persecution. To pretend that matters of academic freedom emerge exclusively from sources outside the academy, the threats to matters of academic freedom emerge exclusively from outside the academy, requires that we look away from pressure on scholars to self-censor and re-evaluate, sorry, pressure on scholars to self-censor and the re-evaluation and redefinition of academic freedom that is taking place within higher education itself, locally and globally. Faced with problematic performances of power within the academy, what value attaches to ignoring invitations to intellectual engagement, to think through what the freedom in academic freedom refers to. In the aftermath, and interestingly, the very site of Roads Must Fall and the Fees Must Fall, it made possible nationally and beyond. Universities have to deal with discomfort made possible by a new generation of students, student movements, marketization, corporatization of universities, and the growth of managerialism within universities all at the same time. All these irritate academic freedom pressure points in painful and productive ways. Careful engagement which eat with all of them and with each, recognizing that they work to very different ends, some closing, some opening all nonetheless are an opportunity to reflect on the difficult. It is easy to respond quickly to threats of government intervention, intrusion. It is uncomplicated to reject corporate intrusions into the humanities, for example. Yet, defending intellectual and academic vitality has to be about more than flexing the muscles we have already had many decades experience in flexing even if we disagree amongst ourselves. It is about the necessity of reflecting on the difficult, like what roads must fall or the RU reference list and other movements internally located probe about freedoms in our universities and unfreedoms in our universities. Reflecting on the difficult, the late, great Edward Said's more deliberate process of reflection, research, an inquiring argument is the more urgent task. What does academic freedom have to say about ways of contesting power variously, internally? What is the permissible under academic freedom? What is our responsibility as proponents of academic freedom when we are confronted, surrounded by internal power contestations? The phase today of contestation is that of student politics. Student politics are at the heart of national higher education yet again. Such challenges are to so much that we previously assumed about universities and how they work, movements and how they work, legitimate political contestation, intellectual work, to the collective memorialization of contestation at places like UCT and VETS and Forte and UWC and Rhodes and so on. We would do well to remember that students have always been at the heart of academic freedom debates in this country. Try as we have 
to rewrite that history. It was students at UCT who started the T.B. Davy Lecture. The extensive archival work of people like Ritumetsu Ubageng Mabogela into the histories of contestations at South African and Namibian universities under apartheid show that although we all speak of liberal universities as descriptive of the spirit of the time on campuses UCT, Rhodes, Natal, and Vets, the liberal protesters were a small fragment of staff and students, comparatively. It is a painful reminder about the power we exercise over the past, what we choose to claim as inheritance, even as we may have resisted it. It is a painful reminder about the power we exercise over the past, of the implication of the epistemic project in constructing and claiming legacies. We would do well to remember that although now romantic, the purple shall govern was painful contestation by a significant and minority activist collective comparatively. When the class of 1968 was expelled from Fort Hare, when they refused to see the successful installation of a known Bruder Bonda, an NP sympathizer, Devet, as vice chancellor, those students were insisting on academic freedom as a right worth defending at all cost. The cost is well known to some of those students who were expelled, the likes of Dumisa Zabeza from that class, the detentions, the tortures, the exiling. Several decades later, in the years 1981, 1982, 1983, 1984, when students on that same campus repeatedly rioted each time Lennox Sebe, president of the imaginary, but albeit brutal, Siskai State, attempted to enter Fort Hare campus. They were making claims to the freedom of the university space against all odds, as linked to larger freedoms, to other freedoms, to all freedoms. Such histories of students as the bodies that blocked apartheid intrusions on academic space and autonomy are inconvenient often now as we make academic freedom debates the sole terrain of academics. The epistemic independence we claim is implicated in these cycles of erasure and claims to rigorous struggle heritages. Yet, again, Students in our midst insist on challenging not just the state and the market, but also performances of power by us. We are obliged to engage questions about the permissible, the faces of contestation, questions of organization, alliances, and, and many of the foundational, my apologies, Knowledges that hide behind freedom to teach what we like, to whom we like, in the ways that we choose. This is much like how some academics in other parts of the world are preoccupied today as part of their debates on academic freedom, with how alertness around new forms of war and a range of activities that are loosely grouped today under terrorism allow the state to extend the expectation of policing, surveillance, and censure to academics interfere with our capacity to engage in academic work. Academic freedom has to be about more than freedom over, against, and to. What is the place of freedom from racism and racial harassment in academic freedom? Can we both teach as academics? Can we both teach? that buildings matter, that art histories are real, that ways of thinking, of seeing and thinking matter beyond the literal, and that st statues are just statues. What do we really mean when we say academic freedom partly means that all ideas must be freely debated? all ideas as long as we approve of them as ideas. In South Africa, we are not able to proceed as though the challenge of student movements exists as linked to, but still removed from concerns of academic freedom. 
if we are serious about the latter. This is especially so given the past of students' centrality in academic freedom, and especially so when students also rely on, cite, and reference ideas that hold considerable sway in critical theory traditions within the academy. Academic freedoms challenge the difficult thinking work about both the importance of critical, reflexive rigor in universities and the significant effects of academic disagreement. If we say, after postmodernism, postcolonial theory, deconstruction, critical race, queer and feminist studies, that the grand narratives of truth, the master narratives, have been destabilized. What does it mean for us to insist on, its, on single truths again? When we are located in the academy and claim the academic, that academic freedom is worth defending, how does that devaluation of intellectual rigor, the devaluation and narrowing of critique, the occlusion of the place of social justice, the criminalization of dissent, impact on academic freedom debates. What are the opportunities afforded to us by these difficult and productive times we live through to test our ideas and our claimed commitment to academic freedom principles? It is a time for rigor and not a time for safety. We know thinking is risky work. Academic freedom is about testing the limits of this risk and helping clarify for all of us, even if we won't agree, why academic freedom continues to matter. What kind of mattering it is if it remains unaffected by new arising challenges. Are such challenges a threat? Always a threat? Or extensions to definitions of academic freedom and are op and an opportunity for fine-tuning our investment, ensuring that academic freedom continues to matter in dynamic and vibrant ways. The challenge of the contemporary moment is an opportunity to revisit definitions as well. What are the real limits of academic freedom? Why does it matter how we build and rebuild institutions? Why does it matter how we teach? Why does it matter to how we engage in difficult contestation? I think one of the biggest threats to academic freedom today is the triumph of neoliberalism. This is most evident in the ways in which, individual, in which the individual receives primacy in contestation. The ways, e the ways in which even the, contest even the contestation engage the ways in which even contestation is engaged on individual basis. This focus on the individual is staged in telling and dangerous ways. Even in many collectives, there is a stress on fighting as individuals for individual achievement and advancement, rather than a collective structural struggle. This is why I appreciate particularly how um, the Professor Ramukond and Professor Pageng spoke about critiquing achievement, recognizing but thinking through what, what makes the exceptional possible and not taking the exceptional as a valuable and valid category, to recognize it only in order to be able to undo it as a category. That is not the work of celebrating the individual. This is not to say, of course, that the individual is not also to be celebrated. It is simply to say that there is a structural project which is often occluded when we are pressured to celebrate and to be satisfied with the only, the first. It is very often also the burden of representation, the burden of representativity, the burden of perfection which again hankers back to those truths that we claim we have undone in the academy, that we are resurfacing and restaging and reviving 
in many, in many ways. We are often in the celebration of the individual, often all struggling to reach the top of a system that remains in itself largely unchallenged, celebrating individual achievement and advancement up old hierarchies that always come with old values. It is the old Audre Lord criticism yet again. As far as we have come, traces of the past's limitations remain very much with us unless we heed her caution and attempt to unmake the master's house with different tools. Abolish some aspects of the system. Not simply undo and break down, but abolish. And I use abolish specifically, perhaps in ways that are particularly apt in this city. Founded on slavery. In this country found, whose foundational violence is that of slavery. Abolish some aspects of the system rather than focusing only on transfer. Trapping us in the failures of the last two and a half decades since 1994 in an individual transfer only means that, sorry, failures of the last two and a half decades since 1994 in an exclusively aesthetic project that is not also always a structurally altered one. The triumph of neoliberalism is also in the pressure and production, as I've said, of the only and the single, not just only and single individual, but only and single explanation. In the painful aftermath of Professor Bongani Mayosi's suicide, I was dismayed to read some of the responses coming out of Cape Town. First, the report that when he tried to resign because he was depressed, this was not treated with the seriousness we would expect from a leading university with its epistemic resources, the epistemic resources that UCT has at its disposal, but a financial offer. Then the explanations and uses to which the grief of his family were put. This UCT is a university with a rich cachet of intellectual and disciplinary resources to make sense of this sad event, to help us understand that depression and suicide cannot be explained in a single source, even if grief needs coherence. Instead, I was taken aback by the clamoring for one explanation as the total explanation and as it moved through social media and got retweeted and rejigged and remixed. The discursive travels to dismiss and avert intellectual labor and rigor, a refusal of reflexive engagement by some UCT academics who retweeted the explanation of coherence that makes sense of grief as epistemic justification for projects that didn't reference the source of explanation that was now useful in this curious, discursive odyssey. I was taken aback by the clamoring for one expectation as the total expectation and its discursive travels to dismiss and avert intellectual rigor, a refusal of reflexive engagement with the meaning of the said events and indeed the meanings and consequences of this event, and yes, the demonization of disagreement and dissent. It seemed strange to me that this approach to a problem a most unacademic response to a problem by academics from a leading university, the curious discursive odyssey of the single explanation for depression. 
The triumph of neoliberalism is also present in the corporate management of many problems across the university scape, rather than applying different kinds of resources that exist in the university, in the academy, to understanding causes and emergent problems. UCT's representation of itself has long been implicated in this. It is my alma mater. So I pay more focused attention to its paradoxes. And many of these seem to me implicated in many, many missed opportunities to make use of what we defend in academic freedom. Why does academic freedom not include freedom from harassment, racism, from determination by capitalism? What is the intellectually principled thing to do? What is the ideal place of argument when we are not an academy that resorts to punishing critical engagements by students? How far have we traveled from the Mamdani affair? <coughs> now that we've invited him, you'll note I'm suddenly we, even though I'm not even at UCT. <laughs> Now that we have invited him to give the T.B. Davy lecture, given him an honorary professorship, have we fully risen to his challenge? Or have we bought ourselves an alibi? A pause. Recourse to the single, to the exceptional, to the special to the visible that Njabul and Debele, to the visible, to the spectacular that Njabul and Debele has so vehemently written and taught us against for over four decades. How far have we traveled since the Mafeje affair? So we name a building after him, but don't hire him. A very UCT thing to do. <laughs> Who is Mafeje's equivalent or heir? And when I say heir, of course I mean heiress. I don't like the S stuff. <laughs> Who is Mafeje today? And has how we engage as the academy, as UCT, with Mafeje today changed at all. For how we have conversations about academic freedom, for what we think about the work of the academy, what universities should be for. Or is it enough that we have named a building after him? Sticking, along, sticking with the business of naming buildings, we also have named a building after Biko. But don't take on board the ideas and principles for which he stood. UCT can call a building after this man as a symbol of something, but is unable to stomach students choosing to eat alone in ways that make sense when we seriously engage with Biko's activism and intellectual legacy. So many years after the painful responses, violent responses to Mampela Rampele's sexual harassment policy when I was a student at UCT, the misogyny, the violence, the threat, the engineering, an engineering lecturer posts what we've all seen, what I will not repeat on Facebook. How far have we moved? Does any of this have to do with academic freedom? How can it not? What is the place in academic freedom of freedom from harassment, from sexual terrorization? And this in a context where my understanding is that students had raised concern and alarm prior to the post 
Now, UCT, of course, prides itself on being a leading university. An intellectually leading university, an epistemically leading university, a prestigious university. I'm not going to mock that claim. This is partly why I applied to UCT. <laughs> so clearly, I also saw UCT clearly. And I stayed, despite, because of. It's why I came here. It is part that leadership, in interesting and wounding ways, has shaped me, and it is leadership that I remain ambivalent about. But how can we make better use of that position? And certainly UCT historically has leadership in terms of the inheritance we have on academic freedom. T.B. Davies started something, that's followed, someone else followed, someone else followed officially. What is the leadership, or we have a leadership opportunity in the context of what Fatima El Tayeb calls a strange temporality, where those who imagine themselves as the automatic custodians of academic freedom imagine that any contestation directed at their specific position is at once an attack on academic freedom principles in total and something which belongs outside of academic freedom debates. So we, custodians of academic freedom, the professorate, can launch critiques of academic freedom, but contestations which target us, which engage us in, 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 in difficult and discomforting ways, have to be foreign to academic freedom. In other words, in this world characterized by El Tayeb, strange temporality, it is both possible to hold on to precepts and principles of academic freedom and be dismissive of the challenge to the epistemic traditions within which we belong. On the other hand, what kind of engagement with critique does academic freedom really invite or indeed in our times demand? Is it possible to continue to pretend that history has no impact on the core of academic freedom and the university's internal structures? Is it possible to continue to avoid reflecting on the historical knowledge that, again, it is UCT students who started the T.B. Davy lecture? As we continue to embrace the lecture itself, but pretend student concerns are irrelevant to discussions of academic freedom, and to do so at UCT, it is important to note that faced with the challenge of recent student movements, UCT, that I'm always hard on, has gone considerable distance to interrogate how to deal with this difficult moment. The errors have been costly, but there has also been immense demonstrable commitment to experiment, to question, to change minds, to change your minds, to engage in difficult thinking. This has existed in the same space as ongoing amnesia about the foundational epistemic violence of the academy, supported by its downplaying and denial of symbolic violence. Often this type of engagement externalizes the problem of academic freedom, thereby making it that which exists outside the domain of what needs to be theorized. This refusal to see difference and the implication of racial, gendered, sexualized, embodied difference, and its reproduction in the very site of its initial theoretical, scientific, and discursive production and legitimation. Those of us who are scholars of the history of race know that it is the academy that legitimized and popularized race as a category in a range of disciplines from English literature, the discipline in which I was trained, to anthropology, to what later became known as race, to psychiatry, to what later known, got, became known as race science. And so while we hold on to the values of academic freedom, it is possible to still, in this denial of this past, it is possible to still criminalize and otherwise surrender some dissenters, 
some critique of the academic project to the brutal state machinery we otherwise stand opposed to as a way to make unspeakable the processes of internal racialization in the university and the ways in which they are inseparable from the after effects of European colonialism. In this way, university structures increasingly posit racialized communities as disposable, disposable populations. And the problem as new and a simple one. In T.B. Davies' time, academic freedom was not unmoored from the responsibility for work of the imagination, the intellect, to intervene into the urgent questions of what mattered and what not, to dissent even in the face of extreme cost, to provide an opportunity of intellectual leadership. Why then, those of us who claim to function in this tradition, why this hankering after such tired binaries that we build careers debunking? Academic freedom debates, academic freedom principles, academic freedom in total, cannot shy away from the challenges to its limits. Challenges that we live in the midst of. And I use challenge here not in the narrow, new South African way, which means a difficult thing that we'll talk about but won't address. <laughs> Right, and the government speak that says we cannot use the word problem. So you have to say we have challenges and you don't address the challenges and you talk about the challenges ad nauseum. I use challenges in the more old, in the old fashioned sense of an invitation, a direct invitation to possibility, to experimentation, to risk, to meeting the invitation in interesting and perhaps unpredictable ways. Academic freedom cannot from a fire, shy away from the challenges to its limits that we live with, to the urgent quest for intellectual rigor away from the single, the exceptional, as enough, away from simply the naming of buildings as substitute for, rather than as part of a structural unmaking and abolishing, to the reflexive exercise on our own work and the attacks on the principles of academic freedom from within our own ranks. <laughs>